Tracy's opening uh, prayer this morning about how we should be focused on God rather than ourselves. It reminded me of a conversation I had last night with my wife. She asked, why, uh, why do you preach behind that pulpit and the other people here, they, they've got a music stand. And I said, uh, why, are you, why do you preach behind a pulpit? And I said, well, because I, I asked if I could use it. And, and uh, I don't know what she thought, if she thought I was too offensive for everyone here, and so they put me behind this big pulpit. But no, really, there's two reasons I told her why I uh, asked to preach behind the pulpit. One is because there's a lot more room for my Bible and notes. But two, historically, the pulpit was designed to conceal the preacher. It was designed to uh, hide uh, the preacher and, and the, the focus, rather, was on the Word of God. If you look at uh, pictures of pulpits from, say, the 16th century, uh, some of the pulpits go almost up to their neck if they're so big. And, and that was, it, was, uh, it was designed that way because theologically they believe that the, the pastor, the preacher, should just disappear and only bring the people the Word of God, and that's what should be the focus, the Word of God. That's the only thing I have to offer you is the Word of God. When I get up here and preach... I'm not giving you my own ideas or uh, my own um, uh, thoughts and feelings. What I'm doing is proclaiming what God has said in His Word. and So that's our goal this morning. I pray that God be heard and not me. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that this morning... So we open up your word that we hear you speak. I pray that I disappear and that we hear your voice through your word. Open up ears to hear, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Halloween was last week. And when I pastored Prairie Bible Church, every Sunday, uh, the Sunday before Halloween, I would ask, now, what are we celebrating October 31st? And just about every year, everyone forgot the occasion that I was referring to. So let me ask you, what is October 31st? Anyone know what October 31st is? What we celebrate on October 31st? No one from Prairie Bible, please. What's that? All, all, yeah, All Saints Eve is that, yeah. But it's Reformation Day, the start of the Protestant Reformation, October 31st, 1517. Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany, uh, starting, launching the Protestant Reformation. And there's, a, there's a number of reasons why the Protestant Reformation started. One was... Uh, uh, a man named John Tetzel came into town and was selling indulgences, and Martin Luther uh, really uh, hated that. And so uh, the, the 95 Thesis had a lot to do with indulgences. But what was really at the core of the Protestant Reformation was a high view of the sovereignty of God. And in fact, as Protestants... We hold to what's, what the Reformers called the, the five solas of the Reformation. That, that these five solas that concerns God's sovereignty over His redemption of His people. These five solas being sola scriptura. Scripture alone is our authority. Not, not the Pope, but Scripture is our authority. Sola fide, faith alone, that we're saved by faith in Christ, not by faith and works. Sola gratia, we're saved by grace alone. It's not anything I do, but what Christ did. Solos Christus, Christ is our only means of salvation. Not anybody else, not anything you can do. And sola deo gloria, all to the glory of God alone. Those are the five solas 
of the Reformation, and, and it focuses on the sovereignty of God. And the sovereignty of God isn't just a, a doctrine that's discussed and debated by Christian theologians in some ivory towers. No, at the end of the end of the day, the sovereignty of God answers the question, how much trust can you put in the God that you worship? How much trust can you put in the God that you worship? How powerful is the God you worship? Is God truly in control of all things? Or is Satan sometimes able to thwart God's plans? Has God decreed all that would happen in the world? Or does God merely react to what happens in the world? How big is your God? Hopefully we'll answer these questions as we go to the Word of God this morning. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46, and I'll start at verse 8 here. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. Let me set the stage for context of our passage here in in Isaiah. In Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39, Isaiah points out Israel's sin, Israel's transgressions against God in both the the northern and the southern, southern kingdoms of Israel. Then Isaiah tells of the the coming judgment of God, that God's had enough of Israel's sins and He's going to to judge them. And this judgment would come in the form of the northern kingdom being taken into captivity by Assyria and the southern kingdom being taken into captivity captivity by Babylon, which would last 70 years. But the point is, God has not forgot His people. We see in chapters 40 through the, through the end of the book that Isaiah tells of how God will restore His people. That God's people are restored by, miraculously restored by God sending Cyrus, this King Cyrus, this Persian king to, to conquer Babylon and thus enabling Israel to return home. And Israel is restored by God sending God's Redeemer, the Messiah, Christ Jesus, who who Isaiah describes as the suffering servant, who's going to take the punishment of God's people. And then we'll see that God will establish His future kingdom of Israel and the new heavens and the new earth. God has not forgotten His people. So there's three main points I really want you to get out of this passage. Number one, remember... Remember who God is and what He has promised. Two, recognize. Recognize, know, and understand who God truly is. And three, rest. Rest in the knowledge that the God you serve will do as He promised because He is able to to do what He promised. Let's look at verse 8 and 9 again. Remember this. Remember this. And stand firm. 
Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I, I am God and there is none like me. Look how God calls on His people to remember. To remember. Remember and stand firm. The New American Standard Bible says, remember and be assured. The King James Version says, remember and show yourselves men. So in other words, stand up like a man. Take confidence in God. Don't shrink back. Remember what God has promised. Remember what God has already done. Remember who God is. So what is it that God has promised? What has God promised? Well, we know from the Abrahamic covenant that God promised three things, three three main things. A land, a nation, and a blessing. Those are the three main things God promises in this Abrahamic covenant. Uh, We read this in Genesis 12. The Lord says, To Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be Blessed, a land, a nation, and a blessing. God promised Abraham this land that would forever be his land. That his offspring would be a great nation. And that his offspring would be a blessing to all the people on the earth. Well, God kept... I made this promise to Abram, and God kept this promise to Abraham. God's people would be a great nation. We see that this great nation later even includes the Gentiles. In Revelation, we see this this picture of all nations gathered around the throne of God, worshiping Him, that Abraham's offspring would be a great nation nation. And then we see that uh, uh, God's people would, in, would uh, have a, a land and, and we see that uh, the ultimate fulfillment of this is that God's people inherit a new heaven and a new earth that all the land becomes uh, the land of the people of God. And then we see that God would bless all people through Abraham's offspring, who Paul says in Galatians 3 is actually Christ Jesus. And all peoples of the earth will be blessed by Abraham's offspring through Christ Jesus. God made a promise and God kept His promise. We see this in the book of Isaiah. We saw this in the, in the brief outline I just gave you for Isaiah Um, God doesn't abandon His people, but God rescues them from exile. Chapter 49, 6, God says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is accomplished through the suffering servant who redeems God's people, making them that great nation and is a blessing to all peoples on earth. Then in chapter 65, Verse 17 and 18, God says, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be gladness. God promised a land, a nation, and a blessing, and that is what God has given. God has made a promise and God has kept his promise. Remember, remember what God has promised. 
Also remember, remember what God has done. God's calling His people not just to remember all that He's promised, but remember what God has already done for His people. I mean, throughout the Old Testament, God is forever reminding the people of Israel what God has done for them. Remember how God delivered you from bondage, the bondage of Egypt. Remember how God destroyed the Egyptians. Remember how God delivered you through the Red Sea. Remember how God provided for you in the wilderness. We see that Israel forever, constantly, need to be reminded uh, to remember God and what He's done because Israel forever, constantly forgot what God has done. They keep forgetting what God's done. In Exodus 15, we see that three days after God miraculously delivered Israel through the Red Sea, they start complaining that there's no water. Forgetting what God has just done for them. After God miraculously provides this water, the Israelites start complaining about food, forgetting how God just miraculously provided water. And then, of course, they, uh, God provides this manna for them, and, and then they complain about that, and God provides quail, then they complain about that, and God provides again and again, and they keep forgetting what God has done, and, and they keep complaining, keep forgetting all that God has done for them. And you may ask, how could Israel be so forgetful after all that God has miraculously and supernaturally done for them? How could they be so forgetful? But let me ask you, don't you sometimes do the very same things the minute that you're faced with a new crisis in your life? Don't you sometimes forget all that God has done for you? Maybe when your car breaks down and you don't know how you're going to afford that repair bill, do you sometimes forget all the times that God has provided for you? Or do you remember God and all the times that He's kept you well and healthy? Do you forget that if you find a, a lump on your body that shouldn't be there? Do you forget how good God has been to you and how He's taken care of you in the past? Or when there's corruption that breaks out in our presidential election, do you forget how God, how good God has been to this nation in the past? I mean, we should, it's more easy to forget what God has uh, done for us than we may think sometimes. And we should constantly remember, constantly remember all that God has done for us and constantly thank Him for all that He's done. That's why we pray before our meals. I mean, we take it for granted that uh, we can eat any time we want, but we forget that uh, it's God's providence that we're enabled to enjoy this meal. Think about all the times God has kept you safe driving on the road. I mean, really, logically, uh, if you think about it, uh, uh, with all the bad drivers and high rates of speed, really, I, I think, apart from God's providence, there should be far more accidents than there, are, than there are. But how many times has God kept us safe on the road, protected us? Remember, remember all that God has done for us, all the times God has kept us safe. Remember what God has promised. Remember what God has done. And also remember who God is and, and who is God. Who is God? As God says, 
in verse 9, For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. If you remember uh, when Moses asked who he should say that... uh, who sent him, God says, I am, I am that I am. God is what we say in theology, talk about in theology, is is transcendent. He's wholly unique. He's completely above us. He's entirely set apart from us. God is who he is. There's none like him. Now, it's also true that God is what we call imminent that He's with us, that uh, 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 He's near us. But just because God is with us, that He's also imminent, doesn't mean that we should forget that God is transcendent, that He's completely apart from us, that He's above all things in His creation, above angels and demons, above everything else. God is, in fact, sovereign over His complete universe. God is above all things. I think sometimes we become too familiar with God. I remember going to a Christian bookshop and they were selling t-shirts that said, uh, Jesus is my homeboy. And uh, I get the I get this sentiment. They're saying that they uh, want to declare that uh, they uh, uh, they follow Christ, that they they uh, uh, love the Lord. But it seems a little too familiar, familiar to to call Jesus your homeboy when He's the Creator of the heavens and the earth that He holds the universe in the palm of His hand. He's a little more than just my homeboy. Now look at verse 10 with me and, and, and see who this God is that we're worshiping. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. As we talked about earlier, remember what God has promised. Remember what God has done. Remember who God is. And now I want you to recognize. Recognize who God is. Recognize, understand, and know who God is. That God is so wholly supreme that He not only works in time and space to fulfill His purposes, But God has declared what will happen from the foundations of the world. That He's declared the end from the beginning. And how do we know this? Well, because Scripture tells us this. Scripture tells us that He's declared the end from the beginning. We see in passages like Ephesians chapter 1. 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, speaking of those worshiping the beast, says in verse 8, And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, everyone whose names have not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. That God had a plan of redemption before the foundation of the world. And not only do we have these passages talking about how God elected from the foundation of the world, we know that God has declared the end from the beginning because we already have the end written for us and the book of Revelation. God has ordained all that has happened. God has ordained all that is happening. God has ordained all that will happen. In other words, 
God does not wait and see what events are going to transpire and then reacts to those events. No, all events in history have occurred because God ordained that they should happen. Now, let me pause here and give you three views of of God's sovereignty. Three views of God's sovereignty. Now, I I like to explain this. I think it's a good picture. Uh, I explain this as if God were playing a game of chess with Satan. So, the number one position is called open theism. Now, open theism really is a heretical view because open theism states that God doesn't know the future. The future's open, in other words, that God doesn't know human choices. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He works within uh, uh, what occurs on the world. So if, if we're viewing God playing chess with Satan, the open theist would say that uh, he's play, God's playing a game of chess with Satan. Uh, God doesn't know what moves Satan's going to make, but you know what? God's a really good chess player, so God's going to win because uh, he's, a, he's a great chess player. So that's open theism. And do you have another view? Uh, and this one's not a heretical view, but it's, it's a view a lot of Christians hold to. And so they say that God knows the outcome uh, of what's going to happen, that he knows all things. And so uh, picture him and Satan playing chess, and he knows the moves Satan's going to make. And so he's able to counteract those moves because he, he knows all things. He's predicted what Satan's going to do. He, he knows how to counteract all Satan's moves. But then you have a third position. And I believe this is the biblical position. That God not only knows all things that goes on in the world, but that He's decreed it or ordained it. So picture God and Satan playing chess, and and God not only knows all these moves Satan's going to make, but God has ordained that Satan would make these moves, and the very moves that Satan decides to make are the very moves that are going to accomplish God's purposes. The very moves that are going to make God the winner of the game. Everything you do serves God's purposes. You cannot thwart God's plans. Even your sin and your rebellion will ultimately accomplish God's purposes. Know that. Even people's sin and rebellion out in the world, though God hates their sin, is ultimately going to accomplish His purposes. For example early church was under tyranny, was under persecution by Rome. Yet, we see also that God uses that tyranny and He uses that persecution to build His church, to strengthen His church. We see the same thing with the Reformers. The Reformers suffered persecution under the Roman Catholic Church, but it's under that persecution that uh, the Reformers flourished. And that's why there's so many Protestant Christians today, because it flourished under persecution. And this is how we see God work out throughout all of Scripture. We see how, how God purposes the wickedness of the Philistines or the Canaanites who attack Israel, but God purposes that those wicked nations as a means to drive Israel back to God. We see this kind of thing in, in, 
exemplified in the story of, of Joseph. Joseph is thrown into a pit by his brothers and sold off into slavery in Egypt. But, of course, Joseph rises to the second highest in command in, in Egypt. And, and uh, uh, we see that it's for a purpose. It's for a purpose, for the salvation of Israel, because this famine comes and, and because Joseph's in this high position, he's able to save his people from this famine. And, and then we see that years later that Israel's in Egypt for the purpose, the very purpose of God delivering his people from the bondage of Egypt. And we know that this is... This had been God's purpose all along. When Joseph's brothers come to ask him for forgiveness, Joseph responds to them, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God is not the author of evil. Make no mistake, God's not the author of evil, but God decrees that man's evil and Satan's evil will be used for his good and holy purposes. That man and Satan cannot thwart the plans of God. And the greatest example of this we have in all Scripture of, is, of course, the crucifixion. Luke and, Luke and John, Gospel Luke and John, they, they tell us that, that Satan enters Judas to betray Jesus. And then we see this cowardly pilot who 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 allows an innocent man to be killed just to appease the crowd and we see the the jewish leaders were so wicked and wanting to kill jesus because they are afraid of losing their position and power and satan and all these people had evil wicked motives to kill jesus the messiah the son of god but god ordained that man's evil and Satan's evil will be used for God's good and holy purposes. God's greatest purpose, the salvation of His people, that He uses such wickedness to save His people. God's plans cannot be thwarted. God's plans will stand firm. When Job's wife, after Job's afflictions, Job's wife tells Job to curse God and die. And Job responds and says, Shall we receive good from God and shall we not also receive evil? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Job recognized that even his affliction that affliction that was caused by Satan was ultimately under God's control. Now, let me clarify here that evildoers will be punished. They will be held accountable for their wickedness. But understand that the evil of men and the evil of Satan can never thwart God's plans. They only serve to accomplish God's plans. Let me give you just a few more verses concerning God's sovereignty. Of course, Romans 8, 28, And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose. All things are going to work for God's people. Psalm 115, 2 and 3. Why should the nations say, Where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. God is able to do all that He pleases because He is God. Isaiah 14, 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. All that God has said will come to pass. 
Job 42.2, Job says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job understood that even in his affliction, that God's plans couldn't be thwarted by Satan. Daniel 4.34 and 35. At the end of the day, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say to his hand, can say to him, what have you done? God is in control. God is in control. And why am I belaboring this point of God's sovereignty? Because when you're in the midst of a crisis, and we all have crises in our life, don't we? When you're in the midst of a crisis, you need to recognize that God is in utter control. Whether your crisis is a fear that our country will fall apart, or maybe a forest fire is creeping towards your home, or a loved one just died from cancer, you need to recognize that God is sovereignly in control of this crisis and that God has decreed that this crisis be purposed for good, for God's people. God works all things for good, for His people, for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Take comfort in that. Take comfort in that. That even the most vile affliction, God has purposed for the good of His people. So when you're faced with trial, one, again, just as Israel is called to do, remember. Remember who God is and what He has promised. Number two, recognize. Recognize, know and understand who God is, that God is all-powerful. And then three, rest. Rest in this knowledge. Rest in the knowledge that the God you serve will do as He promised because He's able to do as He promised. Look at verse 11 with me. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken, I, I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. Now remember God promised Israel a land, a nation, and a blessing. And God promised Israel prosperity. God promised Israel that they would be His treasured people. But Israel's now in bondage to the Babylonians. Now, can you just imagine if China came in here and, and took control of this country and we became in bondage to China? All of us would be asking, where is God where is God? Why has God forsaken us? And this is what the Jews were asking. Think about it. They're in bondage to Egypt. Why has God forsaken us? We're supposed to be His people. Why hasn't God rescued us? But here in Isaiah, we, God reveals that He has rescued them. That God has decreed what will happen. God has decreed that He'd raise up this this King Cyrus, described as a bird of prey from the east, to accomplish his very purposes. His very purposes in freeing Israel. And God assures Israel that his purposes will stand. Just as God ordained King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon to take Israel into captivity so that Israel might repent and return to God, 
God also raises up this King Cyrus of Persia to conquer Babylon so that his people will be free. And all of this is God's doing. All of this has been decreed by God. Daniel acknowledges this and when he says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. In other words, God has done this. God has done this. God is the one who sets up kings and takes down kings. Both good kings and bad kings. The reformer John Calvin famously said, when God wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked rulers. God sets up good leaders as a mercy on his people, and God sets up wicked leaders to discipline his people. Therefore, when God gives us good leaders, we should thank him for his kindness, we should praise God for his goodness, and when he gives us bad leaders, we should pray for God's mercy. Pray for God's mercy. But here's the thing. Even when God sets up wicked rulers, even when he allows wicked men to rule over his people, it will be for the good of his people. God has purposed all things for the good of His people. God has not forsaken His people. And if this is true, if what I'm saying is true, then we can rest. We can rest in the knowledge that God has already declared the end from the beginning. We can rest in the sovereignty of God. We can rest in acknowledging that God is in control of all things. We can rest knowing that God is in control of my life, your life, in control of this nation, in control of disease, in control of um, trials that we go through. God is in control. And the sovereignty of God, again, was a tremendous comfort to the reformers who, who were constantly facing persecution from the Roman Catholic Church. And, and in fact, as I said earlier, the sovereignty of God was really at the heart of the Protestant Reformation. The, the, the reformers knew that it was God who was the author and finisher of our faith, that God saves His people. And no matter what's happening in the world, God saves His people. And if you believe that Jesus took the punishment for your sins, and is now sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for His children, let me ask you, what have you got to fear? What have you got to fear? My children... My children don't worry about how I'm going to pay the next bill or worry about where their next meal is going to come from or worry about where they're going to sleep at night. Why don't they worry about these things? So they just assume that I, their father, have it all under control, that I'm going to provide for their needs. They know that I'm in control. They know that I'm going to do what's best for them. They know I'm going to provide for them. And that's how the reformers and the other saints of the past were able to face persecution. They believed that God was in control and God would only do what was good for them, even if it was painful at the time, even when, even when they were persecuted by wicked rulers. They knew that God would ultimately only do what was good for them because they were God's children. 
and God cared for them. They believed in the sovereignty of God. And brothers and sisters, you can have the the same assurance as the reformers if you believe God is in control of all things. You can stand against any trial if you believe that God is in control of all things. When Israel was in captivity to Babylon, we see here God comforts Israel by reminding them of His sovereignty. Again, one, God calls Israel to remember Remember who God is and what He has promised. Remember what God has done in the past and remember, also remember who God is. That God is all powerful. Then again, number two, God calls Israel to recognize. Recognize, know, and understand who God is. That God is the all-sovereign God who's declared the end end from the beginning. Recognize that in your life. Recognize that God is the all-sovereign God that you serve. He's the all-powerful God. And number three, because God's purposes will stand, you can rest. You can rest in the knowledge that the God you serve will do what he promised because he's able to do what he's promised. The great 19th century preacher, Charles Spurgeon, he wrote this. He says, I believe that every particle of dust that dances in the sunbeam does not move an atom more or less than God wishes. That every particle of spray that dashes against the steamboat has its orbit as well as the sun in the heavens. That the chaff from the hand of the winnower is steered as the stars are in the courses. The creeping of an aphid over the rosebud is, is as much fixed as the march of a devastating pestilence. The fall of leaves from a poplar is as fully ordained as the tumbling of an avalanche. He who believes in God must believe this truth. There is no standing point between this and atheism. There is no halfway between an almighty God who works all things according to the good pleasure of his will and no God at all. Spurgeon's point is this. God is Lord over all, or God is not Lord at all. Either God controls all things, or He doesn't control all things. How big is your God? How big is the God that you serve? Is your God in control of all things or does he only react to what's going on in the world? Do you believe that your affliction is under God's control? Do you believe that your trials have been purposed by God for your good? This is what scripture says. Do you believe it? Do you believe that God is in control over this nation? I hope you do. I hope you do. Because if you don't believe that God has ordained all things to happen, if you don't believe that all things are in His control, if you don't believe that you're Salvation and security rest in His hands. I'm not really sure what hope I can offer you. The fact that God is sovereign, has declared, and declared the end from the beginning and has already won the war is why we can have hope as Christians. We know that God is successful. 
we know that God has won. Christian, hold your head up high in victory. Hold your head up high in victory. No matter what happens, you are victorious because Christ was victorious. Believe that. Believe that. Well, let me close with another quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says, When you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. The pillow upon which you lay your head. So tonight, when you go to bed, and tomorrow, when you wake up in the morning, rest your mind on the fact that your Father, your Father in heaven has declared the end from the beginning, that everything is going according to plan, that nothing in the world can thwart God's plans, and that everything is going to work for good in the end. Take comfort in that. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you that you are God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of all things, that we can call you our God and we can call you our Father and we can have full confidence in you. We can have full confidence in your purposes. Even when we go through trials and hardships in our life, we can trust that you have them under control. Father, I pray that you give us a steadfast, steadfast faith that uh, is able to put all our trust in what you have accomplished and what you have purposed for our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.